forgot. Oh, well, happy Sunday. Happy children's service. How are you today? Good. You doing good? Yeah. What? what? <laughs> you got giggles today, don't you? Did y'all have a good week? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, yes, of course. Yeah? Good things happen to you? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. You don't have to share. It's okay. <laughs> Why? Yes, Jesus is in your heart. That's a good reason to have a good day, right? Yes. I, I was thinking about what we talked about last week, and if you weren't here, that's okay. But it's about how we can be after God's heart. Like David was, he was a man after God's own heart. And we talked about how obedience is a good way to please God. And so today I kind of want to continue on with that. And let's review. What is something we were talking about, something that makes you feel good and pleases you? And somebody, it's my microphone so people can hear me. So we talked about what pleases, what makes me feel good? What pleases me and puts a smile on my face and makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside? And I talked about chocolate. And somebody else talked about snuggling. And somebody else talked about hot chocolate after playing out in the cold. And Hope, what was your, did you have something you wanted to share that made you feel all good inside? What was that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll melt. But you like sitting by the fire and drinking hot cocoa? With the snowman. With the snowman, that'll melt. <laughs> so today, with that in mind, and you've got that feeling of how good you feel, and we want to we want God to feel that way about us and what we do. And so last week we talked about obeying God. And this week we're going to talk about a verse in Ephesians. Hmm? You think? And here's what it says. You, this is a really great chapter. And I wish I had time to read the whole chapter. But this is Ephesians 4. I want to read the very last verse. And I'm going to focus on one thing um, that this verse says. It says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So I want, I want to focus on that word, kind. Be ye kind to one another. What do you, who, raise your hand if you think you know what being kind means. Oh my goodness, hope you had your hand up first. Um, you see, you can have this toy. Oh, so sharing, you can have this toy. Very good. In fact, you, you were next. Um, like, um, being kind means like, like, um, like, um, if you, like, you like, 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 just be nice in general. Yeah. No name calling, right? What? No name calling. Don't call people names. Like, just being nice. Yeah, just so nice what's around. being nice to you? Just be nice in general. So who was nice to you this week? Can you think of somebody being nice to you this week? Nobody other than my mom. Then your mom? Your mom was nice to you? I have one. I bet she was. I guarantee you she was. Okay, Miss Hope, one more. Ooh, are we going to whisper? Yeah, we don't call people names, do we? That's a good way to be kind, being nice. I'm trying to ask. All right, one more. I'm going to share something with you. I said don't call people names like dumb. Right, right. That's very good. Did you have one more thing? I'm going to share something with you. Um, my dad. I was. He gave me a 
Oh, and we rode home from school. Oh, man. No. And you think he did that? Why? Because we had tried it one time. Yeah. But they tried to go back and they ran away from us. Oh. And they ran back to the water. So when, it, when he did it this time, did everything go good? Awesome. That is so cool. I love that. Well, let me tell you what kindness can do. First, it glorifies the Lord. When you do it in His name, that pleases Him. And that's a way to get to His heart. And an example of that is our mission discipleship did something this week. We sent a, one of them big old cards in the mail to Miss Jessie. You remember doing that? Yeah, did she like it? Yes, I'm going to tell you what she texted me this morning. She said... Like a card about that size? Yeah, that big one. Well, you didn't see it, did you? Did you get to come this Wednesday? Oh, yeah. It was huge. It was like this tall and this wide. And we had decorated it and put our names so on it. About that, just maybe a little bit skinny. Yes. Like a little bit... Um, a little bit skinny. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit tall. Mm -hmm. About that tall. About that wide. From here over. Angel. You got a good visual? With angels. Yes, with angels. And let me tell you, she texted me Wait, this morning. So the wood, the wood, um, the outside and then the inside, um, like Yeah, from here to here. And from here to here. Is that good? Yeah. All right. So this is what Miss Jessie texted us. She said, I love my oversized card, big exclamation point. And she, she called it precious. And give everyone and Miss Mission disciples hugs for me and tell them I love them. Isn't that great? Isn't that good to know? Now, do you think that was something kind? Yes. Yes. And do you think that that pleases God when we do that? You're not going to give me a hug? Okay. That's all right. I'm, no, you're not giving me a hug. Oh, am I not? Okay. What if I sneak attack you? <laughs> so I, I tell you all that and share that with you all to let you know that when we do something kind and we're thinking about other people, that it pleases God. And it also helps them, right? It encourages them. So I want you all to think about ways that we can be kind to one another this week. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds good to me too. And we'll ask the pastor to help us do that. Okay? okay. All right. Lord, we thank you for the kindness that you have shown to us. We pray you'd ever help us to do the same for those around us. That we'd be shining lights for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Sean.
Let's turn this morning to the book of Hebrews, chapter 3. <clears throat> Hebrews, chapter 3. We'll start reading with verse number 7. Between the Lord moving and the weather, I've been trying to get this message preached for a month now. <clears throat> With the Lord's will, we'll finish her up today. Hebrews 3, 7 says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation and the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. So a couple of weeks ago we started looking at this warning that is found here. It is the second of the five great warnings that are in the book of Hebrews. And this warning is about the danger of delay. It's the danger of putting things off, especially when it comes to spiritual matters, especially when it comes to our responding when God speaks to us. I believe the writer of Hebrews sums up this war warning in verse 13 where he says, while it is called today, while it is called today, while it is still today, what he's trying to get us to understand is the importance of today. He wants us to see just how important this day is, the significance that it can and does have for you and me, a significance that goes beyond just this life and is eternal. But I wonder, is this day important to us? Do we consider today to be an important day? Or is it just another day? Is it no big deal for us? 
Folks, it should be important. It needs to be important. If for no other reason than the fact that today is all we really have. Today is all we can be truly sure of. Because yesterday is gone. And it's not coming back. And tomorrow may never come. It is uncertain. It is not guaranteed. So for all that it is, for what it's worth, this is it. This is all we know that we have for sure today. And that's why the Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. The writer makes a statement twice in this passage. The first time is in verse number 7. He says, Today, if ye will hear his voice. And he repeats this same statement in verse 15. Today, if ye will hear his voice. Today, today, today. It has to be today. There is a danger in putting off until tomorrow or some unknown future date what must be done and what should be done today. This is all we've got. He says today if. There's an if that we're dealing with here. And the iffy part of the whole thing is you and me. He said that. He said today if ye will hear his voice. He did not say today if he will speak. That's not the iffy part. We can be sure, we can be confident that God will speak. That he is speaking even now. Why? Because he is faithful. (laughs) He always has been and he always will be. And he will speak because he loves us. And he cares about us. And he truly wants what's best in our lives. So he's not going to be silent. He will speak. The question is, are we going to hear him? Will we listen to him? And will we heed to what he's saying to us? We've got two choices when God speaks to us. And two choices only. We can delay or we can obey. We can delay. We can say, not right now, Lord. Maybe tomorrow. Or maybe the next time. Or eventually, somewhere down the road. Just not today. Or we can obey. We can say, yes, Lord. I hear you. I hear you speaking to me. I know you're talking to me. And I'm going to listen. I'm going to do what you're telling me to do. I'm going to respond to you today, God, in faith and obedience exactly the way you want me to. Those are our only choices. We can put him off or we can respond to him. We can delay. But now notice and know this. The writer is saying that if we make that choice to delay, there is a danger in doing that. Now we're aware of this danger when it comes to lost people. We see what a dangerous thing it is for somebody who is lost to wait when God speaks to them. Because we know the only thing that He is going to speak to them about is salvation. He's going to deal with them about being saved. And we know that if they put Him off too long, they may miss their opportunity To be saved. And as a result, they will also miss their opportunity to go to heaven. And they will spend all of eternity burning in a lake of fire, separated from the God who loves them. We see that danger, but we don't really think that it's for us who are saved. But now I want you to realize, the writer here, he's not talking to lost people. He's talking to God's people. In verse 12, he says, Take heed, brethren. So he is addressing his brothers and sisters in Christ. He's talking to those of us who know the Lord, to those of us who are saved. And he's saying, There is a danger in you delaying. 
There's a danger in you waiting when God speaks to you. We might assume that we didn't have to worry about running out of time ever again because I'm saved now, right? I got all the time I'll ever need. So when God speaks to me, there's no need to rush. There's no need to hurry. I can take my time. I can operate on my own time frame according to my own schedule. Folks, this warning here tells us that is simply not the case. That is just not true. There is a danger in delay for us also. And that danger is because of the consequences that can come to us when we delay. We looked at two of them the last time. The first consequence is a defiant heart. That's in verse 8. He said, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Any time and every time that God speaks to us and we refuse to obey, our heart gets a little harder. Now we might have thought, well, that was only for lost people. That only happens to lost people. They're the only ones who when they refuse to obey, that their heart grows harder. No. He's talking to the brethren here. Remember? And he's saying, harden not your hearts. That is exactly what happens. Because when we choose to delay, what are we really doing? We're refusing to obey. We may think we're being obedient, we're just putting it off. Yes, Lord, I'm going to obey at a later date. I'm being obedient. No, we're not. He said today, if you will hear. Today, if you will harden not your hearts. It has to be today, when God speaks. Otherwise, we are in rebellion. That's what that word provocation means there. It, remain, it means rebellion. If God speaks to you today, child of God, and you refuse to respond in the way that He wants you to, you are in rebellion against your Father. You are demonstrating a rebellious spirit. And the Bible says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft in God's eyes. It can lead to a defiant heart. How many of God's people today have a defiant, hardened heart. Second consequence we talked about is a departed faith. In verse 12, he said, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. We said there's a few ways that we can depart from our faith. Number one, we can depart from God himself. We can turn away from God and leave him. Good news is we never have to worry about him leaving us because he's not going to do it. <laughs> when we come to faith, when we accept Jesus Christ into our life and into our heart, the Holy Spirit comes in and he takes up residence within us. And when he comes, he's there to stay. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. God's never going to leave us, folks. Thank God. But we can and sometimes do leave him. Just like the prodigal son left his father and left his home and made his journey into a far country, we can leave our heavenly father also. We said we can also depart from our faith by leaving the will of God. Let me tell you something. The most dangerous thing that a child of God can ever do is to step outside of God's will. To step outside of the will of God for our lives. Because the moment that we do that, we are no longer on course. We are now off course. I'm talking about the course that God has set before us. The course that he has had laid out for us to follow in our lives before we were even born. The same course that Paul said that he had finished. We get off that course, we're out of the will of God. And we are in danger. And that course has two points on it. I'm glad it's not complicated. 
That there's not all kinds of points all over a map. God's got two points for you and me. There's the first one, which is the starting point. This is where we, again, come to faith in Christ. When we're saved, that's where it begins. God authors our faith on that day, at that point. But not only does He author our faith, He finishes it too. He is the finisher of our faith. So He has a second point for you and me. And that's where He wants us to end up. That's where He wants us to get to in our spiritual walk with Him. That's our goal. That's the mark that He wants you and I to press towards all of our lives. And wouldn't it be good, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could go straight from point A to point B? If that was our walk of faith in this life, yeah, it would be wonderful. Many times, though, we go astray. We get out of the will of God. And we said we can also depart from our faith when we leave God's house. Sadly, this is a choice that many of God's people have made in the last couple of years. This is the decision that they've come to. Now they have church on their couch every week, if they have it at all. They're having church on TV or over the Internet. Folks, God has made it clear that He wants us to come to church, that He wants us to be in His house. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. He did not say, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together unless there's a pandemic going on. He didn't say that. Then you can all stay at home. Then you can isolate yourselves and stay away from one another and have church on TV or the internet or whatever. No. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together whether there's a pandemic going on or not. It is God's will for us to be in His house. It is God's will for us to assemble together. It is God's will for us to meet at the appointed time so that we might worship Him and so that we might serve Him together. Another consequence of delay, departed faith. Now there's two more consequences that we need to see and we need to know about and we're going to look at them this morning. The next one is a deceived mind. A deceived mind. Verse 13. But exhort one another daily. Wouldn't it be good if we did that? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing if we actually exhorted each other every day? If we encouraged each other. If we lifted each other up. If we cheered each other on every day. Oh, I believe it really helped. And make a difference. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. There again is that statement, lest any of you. So let's be clear, this applies to all of us. This could happen to any of us. Nobody here is exempt. Nobody here is immune. Nobody here is above this. Uh, so no matter how strong we are in our faith, no matter how settled and solid we are about our beliefs, no matter how many years of experience we may have following the Lord, He said, lest any of you. Okay? So this could happen to any of us. What? Be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now we know about the deceitfulness of Satan, right? Oh yeah. We're well aware that he is a deceiver and that he's always trying to trip us up. He's always looking to trick us, to fool us, to deceive us, to get us to believe something that just ain't true. We know about the deceitfulness of Satan, but do we know about the deceitfulness of sin? Because sin itself is deceitful according to the writer here. There is the deceitfulness that we have towards other people. And that's because we don't want them to find out about it. We don't want them to see what we've done. We don't want them to know about our sin. So we have to hide it, right? We have to cover it up some way. 
Got to keep it a secret because we don't want anybody to know. And so in order to keep them from knowing, we might have to be deceitful about it. And we might have to do some lying ourselves. There's the deceitfulness towards others. But then there's also the deceitfulness with ourselves. And this happens any time that we try to justify our sin. And by justify it, I mean we want to believe that uh, it's okay. That somehow this is okay in my life. It's all right. This is okay because of X, Y, Z. Because these conditions are present or these circumstances exist. That means it's okay for me. Or it's okay this one time. Or it's okay this one more time. Or at least it's this and not that. <laughs> we use that one a lot, right? Because if it was that, it would really be bad. Because that is mm, not good. But this, this is okay. Because it's not that. I'm trying to justify it. We also deceive ourselves when we look to excuse We're trying to excuse ourselves of the responsibility for our sin. We want to avoid being held accountable for our sin. And the only way to do that is we have to find somebody else to blame. Somebody else to point the finger at. Say, it's their fault. They did this. They caused this to happen. They made me do it. We're looking for a scapegoat. And our all-time favorite scapegoat is the devil. And he loves it when we do that. He's like, yeah, come on. Bring it on. I'll be your scapegoat. Blame it on me. Sure, I made you do it. Whatever. Sounds good. The reason he wants us to blame him or blame somebody else is because he knows that if we don't take responsibility for our sin, if we don't own our sin, if we don't say, I know that it's mine and I should be accountable for it, then we can never confess our sin. And if we do not confess our sin, we cannot be forgiven of our sin. It's deceitfulness. And it distorts our thinking. Our thinking is messed up. We're not thinking right. We're not thinking like we should. We're no longer of a sound mind. Thinking is distorted. And it also distorts our perception. So that we're not seeing things right either. We're not seeing them as they truly are. We're seeing them the way we want to see them now. And if this goes on long enough, folks, we'll get to the place where we're calling evil good and good evil. Where we'll be putting or we'll be substituting darkness for light and bitterness for sweet. Our discernment will be damaged. Oh, and that's a dangerous thing. Discernment. It's a gift from God when you get right down to it. It comes from God, especially spiritual discernment. Discernment is how we tell right from wrong. Discernment is how we're able to distinguish the truth from a lie. And we need that now, today, more than ever. Because in the day and the hour that you and I are living in, the world is filled with misinformation. Or that's what they're calling it now. I'll tell you what it is, it's still a lie. Amen. You can make up all the different names for it you want to, but it's a lie. And we need that discernment that can only come from the Holy Ghost of God so that we'll know what's right and we'll know what's wrong. We'll know what's true and we'll know what's a lie. Because we are living in a time where some of the people who are telling you what you need to do to be safe, the, 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 the guidelines that you need to follow to keep yourself and your family safe, 
Some of those people are the same people who will tell you that men can get pregnant. Yeah. Some of them are the same people who will tell you there are more than two genders. So don't tell me we don't need discernment. We need it more than we ever have. If it continues, if we continue to allow the deception in our lives, we can get to the part or to the place where we are hardened. That's the warning here in verse 13. He says, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We can become hard ourselves. Not just our heart getting hard, but we get hard. Become a hard person. Ever known somebody that's hard to deal with? I know you have. We all have. What about somebody who was hard to reason with? That's really scary. Because God says, come now, let us reason together. We get to the place where we won't listen to reason. Especially God's reason. Because he's the one who will come and say, that's wrong. What you're doing is wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. You need to stop doing that. Or that's not true. You shouldn't believe that. That's nothing but a lie. We need to listen to his reason. We can become hard to reason with and we can also become hard to reach. God has a hard time reaching us. We can't hear his voice like we did before. That still, small voice gets stiller and smaller. Stiller. Until we may get to the place where we can't hear it at all. Folks, a consequence of delay, of putting God off, is a deceived mind. And there's one more. And that is we can also be denied fellowship. Verse 14. <clears throat> For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Partakers of Christ. Not partakers of church. Not partakers of religion. Not partakers of community and social gatherings. But partakers of Christ himself. The only way you can do that is you've got to know him. And the only way to know him is through salvation. We come to know him when we are saved when we accept him into our heart and our life as our Lord and our Savior. My fear is this. There are a lot of people today who call themselves Christians, maybe a lot of people who are sitting in church right now who know about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus, not personally. They know his story, but they don't know him. There's a difference. They know his story. They believe his story. They know he was born in a manger in Bethlehem to the Virgin Mary some 2,000 years ago. They know that he grew up and lived a sinless, perfect life. That he went around performing great miracles and teaching the Word of God. They know that he was crucified on a cross. That he laid down his life and he shed his blood so that the whole world could be forgiven of their sins. And they know that three days later he was resurrected. Three days later he came back to life and he is alive forevermore. And they also know that he's coming again. That he will return. They know his story, but they don't know him. You've got to know him in your heart, not just in your head. We have to have a personal, real relationship with Jesus Christ. And once we know him, we can share fellowship with him. We can partake of him. And that's what we're meant to do. That's what we were made for, the writer of Hebrews says. For we are made partakers of Christ. 
You want to know why you're here? This is it. This is why we exist. This is why God created us and put us on this earth in the first place. So that we might know Him and have a relationship with Him and bring glory to Him. That's what life is all about. That is the whole point of life. So if we're not doing that or we're not able to do that, we're missing the whole point. I don't care how good you're doing otherwise, how successful you may be, how famous and how popular you are. If we're not living for Him and we're not living with Him, we are missing the whole point. That like Paul, our greatest desire in life would be to know Him and to know the power of His resurrection and to know the fellowship of His sufferings and to be made conformable unto His death. For we are made partakers of Christ. How? If. Here's another if. And again, the iffy part is us. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. In other words, we are partakers of Christ. We can partake of Him if we stay on course. Remember the course we were talking about? Point A, point B, that God has set for us as long as we stay on that straight line, as long as we remain in the will of God, we can partake of Christ. But, should we wander away, should we go astray, we will be denied fellowship. We will be out of fellowship. We'll lose intimacy with Jesus. We'll lose that closeness we had. Might get to the place where God seems like He's a million miles away. That He's far off, distant. If that's how you feel this morning... Let me just remind you, he's not the one who left. You are. He didn't move. You did. So now we can't feel his spirit like we used to. Now we don't witness his power in our life and in our church like we used to. Don't receive his blessings like we used to. Folks, surely we would all agree that we need more Jesus in our lives, not less. There's no doubt about that. We need more Jesus, not less. To be partakers of Him. Are you a partaker of Him? Are you a partaker of Christ? Are you sharing in His glory? Are you participating in His work? In His kingdom? In His plan? Are you partaking of his love, his joy, and his peace? Well, there's nothing like it. If God speaks to you this morning, whether you're lost or whether you're saved, you got the same two options. You can delay or you can obey. And if you find yourself having put him off for some time now, lost that intimacy, you're not close to him, your heart feels hardened. I know that when this has happened in my life, when I've went through a prolonged period of disobedience, yeah, this pastor's done this, it felt like there was a, a cap over my heart. I don't know how else to describe it. Like there was something blocking my heart. It wasn't open to God. Open to him and open for him. And that was just such a terrible feeling. The good news is, no matter how long you felt that way, you obey today, today, you can have that closeness back right now. You won't have to wait a week, month, however long you've made him wait. You can have it immediately. That fellowship can be restored. That hardness will go away and your heart can be soft once more. Father, we love you today and we thank you for loving us. That you never leave us, that you're always with us and you always will be. 
Lord, I know sometimes we leave you and we don't obey like we should. We want to wait. We want to procrastinate. We want to put it off until a time that we think we're ready. Lord, now is the accepted time. Today is the day. When you speak is when we must respond. We don't get to schedule it. We don't get to delay. Not if we want to be right with you and be pleasing in your sight. I pray that if there's even one here this morning, Lord, that you have spoken to, and they need to do something, whatever it is, from being saved to rededicating their life to you, whatever it might be, Lord, just help them to do it today. They will hear your voice today. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Stay. statement oh to be able to say that and truly mean it for it to be completely true in each of our lives a vessel of honor is what I am today has God spoken to you this morning lost person I feel like you're here today God has spoken to you What he is talking to you about is salvation. How that he sent Jesus to die for you so that you wouldn't have to die for all eternity. It is so dangerous for you to wait, to put it off. We don't know there'll be a next. So if he is speaking to you about salvation right now, oh, you need to respond to him right now. It needs to be today. I can't impress upon you the importance of that anymore. Is there someone here this morning that would say, Preacher, God is talking to me. And he's talking to me about salvation. I know that's what I need to do. Would you either step out and come down to this altar right now and let us pray with you? Or could you at least just lift up your hand and say, 
pray for me. I need to be saved. God's dealing with my heart about it right now. Will you remember me, preacher? I don't want to miss heaven. I really don't. Pray for me that I will do what God wants me to do here this morning. Then there might be a child of God here today. God's not dealing with you about salvation, but He's dealing with you about something. Some need in your life, some work that He wants you to do, some sin you're trying to hold on to. It needs to be today. If He's talking to you, God's people, let's lead the way. Let obedience begin with us. You let Him have His way as they sing. Just talk. 
Does that make you feel good? Should. He's never going to give up on us. I'm so glad of that. All hearts and minds clear. Everybody good. Everybody glad you came to church. Everybody going to come back tonight. Amen. <laughs> Almost got you. I hope you do. We love you. God bless you. Have a good day.